this morning I was thinking about the thing with this uh, SARS and all as they call it uh, this disease that is hitting no they know nothing of how to contain it and I was thinking as he was speaking about earthquakes and things of how that it said to be pestilence contagious diseases how many times there is something brought to this country from other countries, usually in the Far East, as the flu and the different things that are brought over here? Now then, they've got something they don't know what to do with. Well, there'll be more of them. So, let us look to the Lord and keep each other. your presence. We're so grateful today for this day of life. We thank you, Lord, for the privilege to gather here, to have fellowship with our brothers and our sisters. Tonight, Lord, as we've came, Lord, there are needs among us. You've heard these requests. You see the circumstances. You know, Lord, what each one needs. So we just pray that you would extend your hand of grace and mercy Lord, to touch, to supply, to meet every need according to your own will and purpose. We pray for those, Lord, that are sick in their bodies. We ask for your healing touch. Lord, and we just pray once again tonight as we've gathered here now for this time and season of fellowship and worship that you would come into our midst to do the things, Lord, that are pleasing to you. May you help us to be able, Lord, just to yield ourselves in such a way that you would be able to Use us to speak to us and to minister to our needs. Again, we pray for your servant, Lord, as the time would come for him to minister. May you so anoint him, Lord, that he would be able to speak freely now the things that you would have. We commit ourselves in this service to you. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. special on earthquakes and disasters of the 20th century and, and I believe the figure was 90 percent of all earthquakes that happened in the 20th century has happened since 1990. I believe it was 90 percent. So <laughs> that ain't no coincidence. Thank you Lord for saving my soul. Thank Thank you, Lord, for 
saving my soul. Thank you, Lord, for making me whole. Thank you, Lord, for giving to me thy great salvation. So
Thanks to the Lord. His peace just seems so sweet tonight. He's been so good for me for a couple weeks now. And I just felt like a new person and just, just thank the Lord for what He's done for me. I travel back in my mind today and saw the things the Lord has done for me. He paid the debt that I should have paid. He saved my soul with His sweet grace, and I'm so thankful that He took my place. Oh, Lord, I let your light shine. 
All right, come on, Tim. And Melissa and Anna, you get ready. I want to thank the Lord. Um, I don't know if you know about my mom's one of her conditions, <laughs> but um, she, uh, with her heart, she can't walk too far, and she runs out of breath, and she has to sit down and take a break. And uh, it's kind of aggravating because we want her to do things and she just can't. Well, I don't know exactly the whole story, but she got fed up with this medication the doctor had her on. And ever since she's been off of it, she's been doing real good. And uh, she can walk a whole lot further and faster than <laughs> than I can remember her doing in a long time. And I just praise the Lord. Because I know it was the Lord that showed her, however it happened. It was the Lord that showed her, you know. And I just praise Him for watching over. And uh, we went to Spring Mill camping last week. And she come down and she's running around just about as much as anybody else was. Keeping up with the kids and everything else it seemed like. And, and I was really worried about her, but I didn't know she had been doing pretty good for a while. So um, I just praise the Lord. He's He's the one that... He knows. He knows what. It, he knows the answer to everything, and he knows how to take care of everybody. And I just praise him. Shadows fall all around us. Darkness comes to hide.
appreciate them. I just thinking, you know, when I was a boy, it's the spring of the year, my dad would move cattle from one field to another. But he'd always have us all to go out and mend fences because, you know, during the time from one year to the other one, some of the fences would be tore down. We even had rail fences there at one time. You know, tonight, it might be time for some of us to mend some fences. This thing just about over. And it's going to be Beulah land for sure. Married to the Lord. And you, know, you look around, that one that you're standing by or sitting by, you're going to have to see them again one of these days. This, time, this life is over. You're going to see them again. You better appreciate that person in and you better appreciate the grace of God in, in your lives. And I had to. May God bless you tonight. Turn the service over to Brother Jackson. Thank you, Brother. You may be seated tonight. It's good to see our brother, George Brown, tonight. God bless you, Brother, for being here again tonight. And your family. God bless every one of you. Now we're back tonight. I don't know whether we will get the <clears throat> subject finished or not, but nevertheless, we will do our best. And I don't want to just throw it together. I want to be able to say things to make it have some meaning. Now this morning, <clears throat> we talked about verse 1 of chapter 8. Coming right in here against this. And this right here is when the week of Daniel starts. Now you've heard it said through the years. 
The rapture could take place any time. That's just an old denominational philosophy. It's all planned in the scriptures. Everything in the scriptures has to be precisely just the way the setting is. One thing I want you to notice. The seventh seal is in the first verse of chapter 8. It did not follow in continuity over here when six seals was revealed out of the sixth chapter. I'm going to ask the question just for the sake of illustration something. Why was there a broken sequence of time between the revelation of the six seals here, then when the seventh seal is broken over here? That goes to show God knew that there was going to be a period of time, there was going to be people around this world that had never yet heard the message of what that man brought. That's why it's worded that way in the 10th chapter. We can say this tonight. It's been 40 years since that to where we're at now. Look how many are in here tonight that's been born since then. Supposing it had been over then. God would not have left his people here this long. When this thing does reach completeness, and the last revelation from these scriptures are in the bride of Christ to inform her, to acquaint her with her imminent catching away to meet the bridegroom, there's not going to be a long period of years or long months. Matthew 24 into 25, it says this. No man knoweth the day or the hour. It says that four different times. But it didn't say no man would know the day or the month. And I have to say, brothers and sisters, if we will walk with God, somewhere's when that seventh seal is broken here. Then that's why then the 10th chapter lines up right underneath of it. Because the bride of Christ and all that it incorporates now has been born and grew through time from the effects of this and they've reached this point. And once that revelation is dropped down into the bride, not the religious world, but once that revelation is dropped down into the bride, brothers and sisters, that finishes the Gentiles, God dealing with them, to call out of them a people for his name. That's why, brothers and sisters, when you go into the 19th chapter of Revelation, it shows that the bride has now been raptured round about that time, because she's completed. Now, let me say this. Just because the week starts here, that does not mean that the bride has to be raptured immediately. We have a scripture for that. That's Second Thessalonians, the second chapter. Because then the, the Thessalonian church was getting all confused. And they was asking questions. Well, when? I thought we were going to get caught away. And notice how Paul writes that second chapter in the second letter. He said, now concerning the coming of the Lord, he's not talking about the coming of the Lord here because he's coming with them here. He's not coming with them over here. He's coming for them. So concerning the coming of the Lord and our gathering together unto him, that day will not come just because some big TV evangelist said so. It's going to come according to the scriptures. And only the bride will have that understanding how to look at that. And the world will think you're crazy. But I have to say, brothers and sisters, that's why when you come down to the finishing up of that 10th chapter, within that ministry to that bride, there's going to be an anointing come upon a group of men. The same kind of anointing that was on John way back here when he saw the whole thing. John's not coming back alive. But that same kind of anointing, it's the Spirit of God to bear witness to a world of unbelief. 
And it's just not going to be to a bunch of educators. It's going to be to politicians, kings, magistrates, nations. God will do it. You could plan right now to do something other. If God not in, it'll fall apart. But then, brothers and sisters, he will bring about the condition, brothers and sisters, that you will automatically move right into it. And it's not going to last 15 or 20 years. It's going to be a short, we will say, a short testimony of the grace of God. And God's going to make the world out there that thinks you're nuts now. They're going to be made to realize. How come you people know? You see things, brothers and sisters, that church world don't see. One day they're this way, another day they're that way. Now, they, <clears throat> now I want to take it very slow here. So when we look at that first seal, I mean, I said what seal, that first verse. Notice now, that brings the time right against this week. The tenth chapter is where God then completes his purpose to the Gentile bride. That puts us right against the week right here. Now then, a lot of people can say, well, Brother Jackson, what about chapter 7 and this and that? Just watch. Let's see how the contents of these chapters formulate a picture. Don't go by the number. It's written this way. God ordained for it to be written this way. That way, brothers and sisters, the carnal religious man of the world, he reads it. And he says, the more I read it, the more confused I get. Because he don't know where to take that picture and put it at in relationship to time. You cannot take either one of these pictures that's in a pictorial setting and just put it anywhere. There's a precise place in time. It fits. And no other time does it. So now then, <clears throat> we know then, Jesus will be on earth in that 10th chapter. All because... The seal has been broken in heaven, <clears throat> so then the scroll is no longer a sealed item. Notice when we see here in chapter 10, when he's here on earth, that scroll is open. It's no longer a sealed book. He can come then to take away those that he has interceded for in redemption. Now I want to explain something other here tonight. When we see in the third verse of chapter 10, seven thunders uttered their plural pronoun voices. It's not singular. I've heard men say, oh, that's angels. When you say that, brothers and sisters, you are only absolutely going backwards with something. Because when Brother Branham was taken to Arizona, all you have to do is read the seal book of the experience that God gave him up in the Sabino Canyon. He saw them seven angels. That was with him in that ministry. But when you see him come back here, in 1963, in the latter part of March and the first of April, when he read that first verse of chapter 6 to set the setting of the Revelation of the Seals, there was only one thunder. And out of that one thunder, there was not the sounding of voices. He was the only voice on earth that brought the revelation of six seals. How many understands that? Therefore, <clears throat> one thunder, it brought a revelation of six seals. But that seventh seal has not been broken. I've got literature at home. People have sent me. All supposed to be followers of Brother Branham. One man, he starts, the seventh seal starts in the book of Genesis. And I thought to myself when I read through it, the more you read, you feel like you're on a long march going through a jungle in New Guinea somewhere. You wind up confused. A revelation don't take you in that kind of a circle. A revelation, when it does come out, it gives you a clear picture to understand. 
So therefore I have to say, when that man was on earth in 1963, two and a half years later, God took him over the scene. He was that voice of the seventh church age. And he brought a message. And God has let that message lay here till it's been published, it's been proclaimed, it's been preached by every Tom, Dick, and Harry. But at least the message has gone out. And God has sustained time long enough and held that seventh seal off to give that message that he was, that's a voice, to reach the ends of the earth. And the last human soul that was ordained in the plan of God to hear that, they've heard it. Whether they heard it in a negative or whether they heard it in a positive. The point of it is, it had to bear witness. That's why in the days of the sounding, it's in when that thing is going to absolutely be published, proclaimed, and preached and everything. It's when God finishes up the mystery. It's His church. How He come to the Gentiles to take out the Gentiles, the people for His name. Now as we reach the nearness of that ending of time, then I have to say, God sees to it that we're near the week. That don't mean the week has started yet. But it means we're near the week. And we're waiting on something. And I have to believe, brothers and sisters, we've heard much since the Gulf War. President Bush, Tony Blair of England, and all the heads of state, they've got their plans. They're going to put pressure on Israel and the Palestinians and you might say force them to come and negotiate. And the United States is more or less in the front row of leadership. They're going to dictate the terms by how this Middle East peace process is going to go into effect. Now there's a lot of people who have forgotten a lot of the Old Testament. But don't forget, it tells you in Zechariah the 12th chapter what will happen in these last days. <clears throat> And the church will still be here. In these last days, God said, I will make Jerusalem a cup of trembling. One man told me he asked a preacher, oh, that was fulfilled a long time ago. That just goes to show how crazy some preachers are. Not that scripture. Because it plainly tells you there. To them round about. That means the Arab world. And keep in mind, brothers and sisters, this Arab world is the one that's got this Islamic complex. They would like to get rid of the Jew. They're trying to make the world believe they are the heirs of Abraham. And they're the ones that's going to put things in order in the Middle East. But that's not what God said. So first Jerusalem, a city, that never was an Islamic city in ancient times. The Islamics want to hold it as their holy place. It never was their holy place. So we will say this. Then the next verse says this. He'll make Jerusalem a burdensome stone. To all that become occupied with it. That's your United Nations and all the other figureheads of the political world. And God said this, though all the world be assembled against Jerusalem, I will break them to pieces. There ain't no United Nations, United States, Tony Blair, anybody else going to have the final answer. Who controls Jerusalem and who don't? In their road to peace, they've already designed that there's certain areas of old Jerusalem that will go to the uh, Palestinians. That's not what the Bible is talking about. So the point is tonight, brothers and sisters, we're approaching a short interval of time there's going to be a miracle war. Now the world has saw a military war that really was scientific miracle. Because you go back to 1940s in there. Let that kind of a war had to be fought against the islands of the Japs. When your warfare is the old conventional types of rifles and things. 
There would have been thousands of men dead by now. But this was a miracle war. God permitted it. God allowed it. But I'll have to say, we've got a lot of Christian people that have stopped reading the, any of the Old Testament. But when it comes to not the time, brothers and sisters, that we can see Jerusalem is the world's prime number one target, what we're going to do with it. Then you go to the seventh chapter of the book of Micah. Oh, that's a minor prophet. We don't pay no attention to them. Yes, you better. Because it plainly starts out and says, In the days that thy walls are to be built. God says, Again is the word that means, I'll repeat it. Again, I will show unto him, Him who is Israel. As it was when I brought him out of Egypt. Well, God showed his miraculous power, didn't he? Again, he will show his miraculous power with the Jewish people in a military way. Sure, they've got some of the same high-tech weaponry that we've got. But that don't mean that they have to use all of that. Because if God's going to do something to fulfill that seventh chapter of Micah, it plainly tells you there, I will show unto him great and marvelous things, insomuch that the heathen, well now don't point to the black men in the jungles and the South Sea Islands. You point to all of these professors of university ignorance. They're so smart and they know so much. Them's the ones God has got his finger against. He's going to show this educated scientific world He's still the God that rules in the heavens. And he will put up whom he will. He'll put down whom he will. He'll cause to come to pass and fulfill things just exactly, precisely, right on time. When is it to be? When the temple's to be built and Jerusalem is to be renovated. Getting it ready for the millennium messianic reign. Now I have to bring that in there to show you the setting now as we continue on. So then when we do come down and see that thunders in the Revelations, the 10th chapter. I've said this before. That's in the plural. There were seven voices. Not in the singular. They're in the plural. And some will say, well, that's seven angels. Well, there were seven angels with Brother Branham, but there's only one voice. Think of that. No verse is it written there were seven voices. But in this, John heard seven distinct voices uttering what them thunders meant. And so I have to say, it's not angels. Some words within the bride ministry, there are men that have dedicated themselves, and God knows every one of them by name. They're not all in Indiana. They're not all in the United States. They're scattered all over the earth wherever the bride of Christ is at. Now, Brother Jackson, all right, what about it, Brother Jackson? We start out, there's seven churches that sets the type, don't it, through time. Then we see that there's seven church age angel messengers, isn't there? That's been through time. Well, then why can't God have seven men right here on the end of this to finish it up? <clears throat> they don't write another Bible, no. But out of their lips will come an inspired prophetic utterance that's going to equate the bride of Christ the world over. Of the soon coming of Jesus to take this bride out of here. And they're not going to proclaim it to the world. Only to that little bride of Christ that's got an ear to hear. And once that's said, brothers and sisters, you can rest assured. The bride ain't destined to be here very much longer. Now then, <clears throat> with that in mind, we haven't got one thing started yet in the beginning of the week. Now I want to bring chapter 11 in. Well, Brother Jackson, chapter 7 goes in there. 
You listen to me. I'm putting this together by the pictures that's in it. Not, not by the number of the chapters. Did you know, brothers and sisters, when you see that seventh chapter, all you see is an angel coming by the way of the east. And he cries to the four angels that held the four winds of universal conflict that many times rises up to blows on the sea of humanity. Religion, war, politics, and military might. And the angel says, hold back the winds. Tell we, we who, only one angel's done the flying. That's in the introduction of chapter 7. He's not going to do the sealing. That's why, brothers and sisters, you bring in chapter 11. Listen carefully. Why? Because chapter 11 shows you that the temple's already built. Read it first, star. When John sees the picture setting of chapter 11, he was already given a reed like unto a rod to go out and measure the temple and the altar and them that worship therein. But the court without leave it out. That goes to show by the time, brothers and sisters, that them two prophets are to step forth on the earth. That temple is already going to be in the process of completeness. But the time will not allow it to be completed in completeness. How many catch my point? You cannot have a ceiling until you've got the means there to do the ceiling. That's why you don't put chapter 7 over 11. You do it just the opposite. How many understand me? You cannot put chapter 7 up here, 144,000 sealed, when you have the means there to do it. How many understand me? Sure, the angel said, hurt not the earth and the sea or anything. But that's not the way you fulfill the picture. You've got to have the means there to accomplish what is to be fulfilled in that chapter. So that's why. By the time, brothers and sisters, you put the 11th chapter in here, the Jewish temple is already in the process of being completed. That's why there had to be a miracle war fought just prior to the beginning of that. So then when you bring chapter 11 in there, you put it right up there in the top. And you see that two prophets. How long are they going to prophesy? The duration of this. <clears throat> now then, you bring the se seventh chapter right in underneath of it. But notice, the first chapter, I mean the first part of the chapter 11 down to the 14th verse is the ministry of them prophets. And then about the 14th, 12th, 13th and 14th verses, they're killed when this time comes. Then notice what is left in the 15th to the 19th verses of that 11th chapter. You have the seventh trumpet. That seventh trumpet was not in the seventh chapter. That seventh trumpet was announced in the 11th chapter. So it goes to show, when you take the first seal off to the 8th chapter... And you put it right here. Then what time moves in, brothers and sisters, you've got the two prophets on the scene in chapter 11. The rest of chapter 8 is about six trumpet judgments. And then, when you take the first part of the 11th chapter, which is the prophets, when you get to the end of brothers and sisters where they're killed, then you've got the seventh trumpet right in line with the sixth in the, cha in the eighth chapter. How many understand my point? Now then, <clears throat> so with chapter 11, right in here, ready to start, the temple is built. The city of Jerusalem is also in the process of being renovated. Now a lot of people don't think that the city of Jerusalem is going to be rebuilt. It will. Why? I've heard preachers say, well, that can be done in the millennium. God have mercy upon some of these preachers. If you would listen to them, they'd put the whole thing off till the millennium. 
I want you to know when the time comes for the millennium to be set in order, and Jesus is here, there ain't going to be another war fought with him sitting on the throne. All of that's done back here prior to this era of time. That includes Ezekiel 38 also. So with that in mind, brothers and sisters, the 11th chapter, you've got your prophets right on the scene. Now what it says in the 7th chapter, now there can be something sealed. But who's going to be sealed? It's the contents of chapter 7. 144,000. But chapter 7 leaves it as only, there's just 144,000. But when we get over here a little further in chapter 12, we see that something else was enlightened. So now, brothers and sisters, don't leave chapter 12 way over in here. Don't do that. Because when the middle of the week comes, 144,000, what do they do? They've been anointed to preach the everlasting gospel through this period of time. Why? Because they were sealed in back here. Well, then where did this woman in Revelation 12 receive her information? Where to flee to? She learned it over here from the two prophets. How many catch my point? That's why you put chapter 12 here along with this. Because then when the middle of the week comes, brothers and sisters, and that Antichrist that has made a covenant here, but he's kept things quiet for that three, three and a half years. Brothers and sisters, then when he does break that covenant with the nation of Israel, he will kill the two prophets. And by the time he's accomplished that, that 144,000 Jews that's been sealed, they won't have to stand around like a bunch of Gentiles. Now what did he say? How did he say that? They're going to know exactly what to do, where to go, and preach the everlasting gospel. It's not a gospel of salvation. It's a gospel to a mortal element of humanity. And everybody knows tonight, brothers and sisters, for the past 50 years, there's been a spirit in this planet to dream every nation, every race of people from their original faith, if they've ever had faith in God at all, to take it away from them. That's why here in America, brothers and sisters, they don't care how many Muslims come here, but the old America that I was born and raised in, when we used to go to our one-room schools, and they could stand and let's say, let's repeat the Lord's Prayer. There was no hypocrite standing around and said, you can't do that. I remember when children came from home, Dad chewed tobacco. But I'll say this, he had respect enough for the Bible. I believe it's the Word of God. And he wasn't long in letting you know about it. So we stood and bowed our head, repeated the Lord's Prayer. But look what we got now. And I told a man in Walmart the other day, and I said, yes, and you got hell on the streets in America. All because you took God out of society, you took him out of the schools, now you've got it. Hardly a week or month goes by, but what they ain't shooting in the schools. It's what they learn on TV. Because you've got another element of brothers that say, well, I believe we are. Democracy gives us freedom of expression and speech, I have to say. A true freedom don't give you a right to act like hell. Or talk like the devil. That's stupidity. Who wants to walk down the streets looking like a devil? And we've got them today that way. And I hate to say it, brothers and sisters, but they live like the devil too. And you didn't go to, need to go to school to learn how to live like a devil. All you need to do is just watch television. So now let's, let's get a hold of this. <clears throat> so we're saying this. Chapter 11, the first verses, shows the two prophets on the scene. The temple is built and... The Jews are offering animal sacrifice on the altar. 
and things are progressing. The two prophets begin to proclaim to Israel, and through that three and a half years, there's an 144,000 of Jews sealed away. And that's exactly when that woman, now who is this woman? That's just an anonymous, that's an anonymous element of the overall Jewish society. Men, women, little boys and girls and everything. Because God's going to preserve an element of them, brothers and sisters, to repopulate that nation when his wrath is executed over here. I'll never forget. <clears throat> Years ago, the man called me and said, Brother Jackson, we understand that you say, this little baby's going to be born in the millennium. I said, I sure did. Well, I don't say that is true. I said, why not? Well, I believe that that could mean that Little babies that's died now can stay like that. I said, shame on you. You want to tell me that a little baby that would die now and it's going to remain a little baby through the millennium just to fulfill your miserable, narrow-minded vision of little children? When my Bible tells me in Matthew 25, when Jesus does come, over there at the end. And he sits on his throne. And then the bride's going to sit on thrones that's given to them. And then, brothers and sisters, he's going to lead before him a mortal element of humanity that somehow or other has been able to escape the wrath and the terrible calamities, cal calamities that's going to hit this planet. And, brothers and sisters, he's going to separate the goats from the sheep and it's not whether they're filled with the Holy Ghost. It's not whether they've been baptized or not. It depends on just how they have conducted themselves as a decent human being. Them's the ones he's going to allow to pass in to his kingdom. And that's why there has to be an element of that Jewish nation. Because keep in mind, one reason that prophets have to come on the scene and start smiting the land with these trumpet judgments it's because the political Jew has sold the nation out to a covenant with the Antichrist of Europe. I hope you catch the point. So therefore, brothers and sisters, <clears throat> that woman of Revelation 12, she's right in here also. Here's where they're sealed. Here's where they're informed. So that then when the time does come, that that Antichrist, which now comes into power here, that's why I said this morning, starting with the 13th chapter, you see the rising of that old Roman system, slowly. But as we pass through the war years of World War II, now you begin to see it collectively, geographically, come together with the ten nations of Europe, reunited. And now, they are absolutely a united European market. They have now got their own currency. And the Pope right now knows that the day will come. It will be handed over him, the leadership of a whole stinking mess. And don't think, brothers and sisters, that the United Nations is going to have a thing to do with it. Because they are not a beast. They are a counterfeit. They are just mere something other that God has allowed the devil to put out here to brainwash a bunch of people with. Because, brother, when they try to absolutely dictate the terms of what we're going to do with Jerusalem, that's where God has promised to tear them to pieces. He didn't say that about the Roman beast. How many understand that? Because that beast that came up out of the waters. Now, by the time that beast then fulfills the role that she's to start doing here, yes, the prophets will preach, 144,000, and the woman Revelation 12 will be sealed in. But now then, let's go to the middle of the week. The Antichrist now, he kills the two prophets. Their bodies lie in the streets of Jerusalem, three days and a half, and then God resurrects them to glory. With that in mind, now they've gone to the world to preach the everlasting gospel. 
But this woman of Revelation 12, she's also took her flight. Now, brothers and sisters, I've said this for a long time. The old denominational ideas, they're going to flee to the ancient city of Petra. Brothers and sisters, I have to say, where in the world was you born and raised at? Now, just take a look at this Iraq war. Do you know from Jerusalem over to the old ancient city of Petra is only about 80 miles by the way the crow flies? How would you like to stick about two and a half million people over there in an old barren canyon? And the only water there is, it just comes down through a ditch. Now, I'm saying these all these things, brothers and sisters, to show how people blind they can get. Do you think they can hide from modern military weaponry? You can take 12 helicopters, brothers and sisters, with all the weaponry it's got on now, and terminate them people in nothing flat. A, young, a, a brother comes from down in the southern part of the state, up here every Sunday morning. He was talking to a Baptist man about the same situation. And he said, it's going to be Petra. He told him, he said, it can't be. Because there's not enough means there for the food. Oh, he said, but God will supply. Now that you went against the scriptures. Let's remember to read the scriptures the way it says. Not the way we want to twist it to make it say. And the woman fled into the wilderness, into a place where she hath, past tense, it's already been decided in the mind of God, where she's nourished for three and a half years. The minute she left that land, here, it made the devil mad. So he went after her. But where she was at, he couldn't get to her. And it tells you, brothers and sisters, in the latter part of that 13th chapter, that the earth opened up its mouth and swallowed that flood of hatred, persecution, ridiculement. Now, the ground don't talk. You know that. How many understand me? But the earth opened up its mouth and swallowed it. So therefore, brothers and sisters, wherever that woman fled to, there has to be a geographical nation of people that will stand with our arms out. And the scripture says in the 13th chapter, where they went to, they, well, who is they? Notice how I say this now, they. Surely to goodness there's not politicians. It's some people living somewhere in this world that haven't become so anti-Semitic that they have to have a stomach ache every time a Jew is mentioned. And I have to say, brothers and sisters, God had already foreordained that place long before the new world had ever been discovered. And brothers and sisters, I'm talking slow. I want the points to get into your mind. I've said this for a long time. Wherever that woman flees to in this geographical world, that part of that world, the people that are there, are going to absolutely be prepared by God. And He's going to let something come along and cleanse them of all of their rottenness, devilish ism. It'll be a preliminary judgment by God because he prepares it. Not Bush, not Tony Blair. God prepares it. But keep in mind, when he wants to put a right thought in the right mind of people, he can cause the whole political process to go in reverse. Listen carefully. I want to ask you this. Think seriously. It plainly tells me, brothers and sisters, immediately after the tribulation of those days, that's this one right here, 
Armageddon's fought here. But then we see the sixth seal. The heavens declare the sixth seal. The sun becomes darkened. The stars, they fall. The whole celestial elements speak of that sixth seal. It's the wrath of God. Jesus is revealed from heaven, sitting on a white horse. Who is all these people that's on them white horses? It's you and me. It's you and me. I hope to God we are there. That's what we've been living for, ain't it? And you're not going to be there because you're a Baptist or anything else. You're going to be there because you're a Holy Ghost filled Christian. You got the revelation truth in your heart that separated you from this rotten mess down here. So brothers and sisters, he's coming to execute God's wrath on this planet. And let me bring this in. Right now across America, you've got political after political politicians, universities, professors of ignorance and science and all of this stuff. Don't talk about God around here. But I have to say, somewhere's up the road in front of us. If America is that little part of the earth that that woman can flee to, so that, that Roman beast can't touch her. It's got to be far enough away, brothers and sisters. I hope you understand what I'm talking about. And I have to say this. What good would it do God to take that woman of people, Jews, out of here, to take them somewhere to hide them and protect them so that the devil, the system, couldn't get at them? Listen carefully. And then he rises up to shake this planet. And he kills them where they went by just tidal waves, hurricanes, storms, earthquakes, and all of those kind of things. Because that's what's going to rock this planet. Because that sword that goes out of his mouth, don't tell me it's going to be a literal piece of iron. It's the authority to execute wrath. And when he does that, brothers and sisters... He's going to turn the elements of nature loose and the elements in this earth loose. And it plainly tells you in the Isaiah the 13th chapter and he will rise up terribly to shake the earth and the earth will reel to and fro like a drunk man. Oh, I tell you, brothers and sisters, you ain't never taken a ride yet. But those that's on this planet, when that happens, brothers and sisters, there's going to be a ride. I hope you understand my point. But oh, we're just so religiously oriented. Well, it could happen one of these days. But I'm not worried. If an earthquake was to hit this building tonight before we got out of here, brothers and sisters, I'd be afraid that all the, <laughs> the things we might hear, everything would be just like when we was coming back from Israel one time. We was coming into New York, and there was a storm right up there in the skies and the clouds. And here we're in a circle like this. We was in our flight pattern, pattern coming down. And all of a sudden, there was a bolt of lightning outside of that plane. It reflected through that whole fuselage and the inside turned green. You ought to have seen the, the, you heard the cries and the screams and the Hail Marys. Oh my land, they were just going everywhere. Straight in. That's the way people do. Now I say that only to illustrate a point, brothers and sisters. When God actually takes that woman out of here, she's going to know because she heard the two prophets. Because, see, she's got the wings of two eagles. That's the message of the two prophets. And she knew exactly where that place is at. So, brothers and sisters, she went there to hide. So I have to say, brothers and sisters, if America is that place, there's a lot of things in store for America. And the politicians are not aware of it. But Christians, I pray that we can understand God knows exactly how to put everything in place. 
Because if he did bring judgment then on the place where she fled to, he'd be just as justified to let her leave and let her stay in the land, wouldn't he? Right. So why did he take her out of there? Why did he give her that information? It's a place that she could flee to and be saved physically and mortally. Because he's going to use that woman to repopulate that Jewish nation in the millennium. I hope you understand it, brothers and sisters. Now then. <clears throat> we can see then how that the 12th chapter lays right in here along with the 7th chapter. But we put the 11th chapter above here because the two prophets has to be here to constitute all of this. That's got to be a fact. Now let us look at this. When the middle of the week comes, now the beast we see here in the 13th chapter becomes the beast in the 17th chapter. Because in the 17th chapter, you see exactly where the spirit of it came from. You didn't see that in the 13th chapter. You just said you see the beast rise up out of the sea, didn't it? But the description of it tells you it's the same old Roman Empire. It's got a wounded head. But when we get to this point right here, brothers and sisters, that's when the 13th chapter beast becomes a 17th chapter beast because it plainly tells you there. It's the beast that was and is not and yet it is. And he shall ascend out of the bottomless pit. Only a spirit goes down there. So that takes you back to time when that Roman beast was wounded. It was wounded through the Reformation. Then that spirit went back into hell. So then we will say domestically the beast kind of died down. But then after the wars of World War II, we come into this era like I brought up this morning. Slowly, conditions begin to prevail. It starts at being resurrected. But brothers and sisters, tonight, that beast is on the earth, and she is ready to start setting in motion exactly what she's supposed to do as we approach the week. But when she's here, brothers and sisters, she becomes that beast in the 17th. Same thing, it's just she moves time-wise. And now, brothers and sisters, it's the devil out of hell takes it completely over to dominate, to rule, and absolutely destroy with tyranny. And it'd be worse than Saddam Hussein, if you understand my point. That's why the 17th chapter absolutely carries through. Now then, watch this 144,000. They have the everlasting gospel. The woman is sealed away. <clears throat> As I said this morning, the Catholic Church is moving fast into an era she's going to be judged. Because when we see the priesthood here in America... The trials, the lawsuits that's being thrown against her by society. That should begin to tell people something. <clears throat> if that could go on here in America, <clears throat> wait till the time comes that the time is laying in Europe that Europe now has the complete control. I have to say, brothers and sisters, when you go to that 14th chapter, <clears throat> And you see it, brothers and sisters, where now these, this 144,000 is anointed here to preach the everlasting gospel. There's three things they will proclaim. Number one, they will condemn atheism. They will point the finger to every educational system on this planet. And it plainly tells mankind, fear God. Worship Him that created the heavens and the earth. Now, when you digest that, brothers and sisters, that's just plainly putting it down in common language. Come out of this stupor. There's a God. And they're the last elements of humanity that's going to have that kind of a message to proclaim. Number two, they're going to claim and proclaim, come out of Babylon. 
And then they're going to pronounce doom upon the people that receives the mark of that beast. That's why, brothers and sisters, those things have to be proclaimed through that 14th chapter. I hope you understand my point now. Therefore, as the 14th chapter comes in here and is being applied, now we bring the 15th chapter in. Because the 15th chapter has got your vials. And the minute the time comes, the Antichrist has taken over. He's ready to rule this earth the way he wants to. That 15th chapter, them vials, them angels are all in place. Because brothers and sisters, they are the preliminary elements of the wrath of God. When you read each one of them, they are all executed through nature. So I have to say, brothers and sisters, when we get these chapters and the pictures they contain, we can't help but see how they are applied in their proper time factor. So, brothers and sisters, I want to say tonight, the book of Revelation is just like a giant puzzle. All the pieces are laying here in a little box. But you've got to have a little picture first in your mind to know what you're going to start with. That's why you've got to start with the first three chapters because they cover the whole scope of time from beginning to the end of it. But then when we come to that last seventh, seventh church age, which is Laodicea, we're dealing with all the rest of this in the last 100 years. None of this goes on back in 1800 and something. How many understand me now? It's all absolutely. After we've crossed from 1900 and the Pentecostal revival hit, then world conflicts, nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom, earthquakes in diverse places. And I heard him say tonight, now then this SARS thing, which has absolutely come up in the, the Orients. Really, they're scared. They're afraid that this thing absolutely somewhere is not, we will say, boxed in that it could break out into other parts of the civilized world. And God only knows, brothers and sisters. But then I heard said the other day, within so many more years, there could be 45 more million people have AIDS. And I thought to myself, they would have never been AIDS had man not changed his lifestyle. But when a bunch of devils begin to educate our younger society that they can live like the devil and nothing wrong, then they cause God to just reach out here and turn a devil loose. Because all of these sexual diseases, brothers and sisters, don't start with healthy people. You know that. It's always because an element of people want to walk contrary to the, to the moral laws of God. And now, brothers and sisters, what taxes have been put in through the government channels of taxing you to pay for old people's sicknesses and things. Now then, they want to take that and spend it on a 19-year-old age that's about ready to lose his mind. And now then, they're taxing the, the treasury to pieces. So I have to say, brothers and sisters, the innocent people can't win for losing but if you think God's going to let this world stand here and go on another 100 years like this, you're wrong. And I want to say this tonight. If they would take in this thing, <clears throat> brother, they fought the cigarette with the tooth and toenail. They made laws here. Why don't they do AIDS the same way? We don't want to. You can't discriminate. Well, what about that old-timer brother and sister? He likes to chew his tobacco and spit it. He likes to smoke his corn cob pipe. I'm not for it, but let's use some common sense. Why should the government become a god to one thing to put it out and condone it over here coming out of hell? So you'd see, brothers and sisters, we're at the end of time. <clears throat> and time's running out. 
Now I'm going to quit on this, brothers and sisters, right tonight and leave it right where it is. Because when I, when I do finish it up, brothers and sisters, I want to give the last setting of this. That 16th chapter, that 15th chapter, them wraths, and what we see unfold. And then, brothers and sisters, Jesus is going to come at the end of that week. And I'm, I'll be so glad. <clears throat> and I pray that we're all ready for that rapture in bed. Heavenly Father, I pray tonight. Take these words, Lord. You put them together in each and every mind of your children. Let us see this thing as a picture, Lord. That we might know how to relate ourselves in it and to you, Lord. As we live in a troubled, sick world. That's trying to politically figure its way out of here. And buy its way out of here. When we know, Lord, that's not true. God, just help us in this closing day of time to see your word and see your grace. And may we all together grow in your love and grace and in your truth. I thank you, Lord, for every brother and sister that sits here tonight now. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> Don't forget, starting Wednesday now, <clears throat> I mean Thursday now, is our convention. And I pray that we'll all pray and be prepared for that time. has a singing I have a little announcement to make here it says the church doors will be open one hour before service starts now this is concerning the meeting starting Thursday senior brothers and sisters 55 and older and the handicapped will be let in first they should line up on the ramp anyone who cannot arrive one hour before and need special assistance, please speak to any of the deacons or trustees for arrangements. We ask that you don't save seats except for your spouse. We ask the younger ones to please use the gravel lot back over here to park your cars and leave the main lot for some of the older ones. And our parking lot is shrinking drastically, so that would be very helpful if the young ones would do that. Uh, we ask that you don't Cut in line going out to the fellowship hall. Just be courteous to one another. Uh, for those.